It goes without saying that sometimes in the horror genre, some things get messy. Very messy. That's why we're digging at the bottom of the barrel to bring you this list of horribly bad horror films. So hopefully, you never fall victim to their epic shittiness. I can't fuck with the witch no more. Like, even if, if someone tells me the drugs are still free, I can't fuck with the witch no more. Keep in mind, this isn't a list of so bad they're good horror films either. Except for Dracula 3000. These are truly some rotten eggs. When a horror film has so few scares, so little artistry, so feeble a grasp on story and atmosphere that it honestly frustrates you as you watch, you've stumbled onto the darkest side of the horror genre. The devil side. I'm Dr. Briggs. And Bojangles. And we are presenting 10 seriously bad horror films. Did you hear that? The Evil Woods. Let's imagine horror as a by-the-book genre in which a group of young friends travel into the woods only to arouse the anger of a malevolent local force and all get killed off. If you're a horror fan, you're probably annoyed by that generalization. 2007's The Evil Woods lives by it, and in effect manages to come off as even more lazy and cynical. And oh, it is annoying. When you're halfway through the Evil Woods, you'll find every major character is still alive, and their being alive is honest and truly grating on your nerves. You hate the kids for their toxic, incompatible personalities, you start to hate the killer for his inaction, you even hate the scruffy, crazy Ralph type for being a buzzkill. Then you just drift into this painful black abyss. God didn't save Walter that night. And you realize that the only character you're becoming attached to is actually the intentionally annoying frat boy type. If only because you know his presence is causing the other characters as much pain as it's causing you. I need anything? Some Preparation H, Vagisil, Monistat 7, Valtrex? What the hell kind of breakfast do you call that? He ate all the lunch meat, all the bread, all the brownies. Get lost. And backwoods bastard? He dies first. Oh, fucking pussy, who hit somebody from the back? Leaving you about 15 minutes with no one to even pretend to root for. Granny. Another typical fraternity initiation gone horribly wrong film. Sadly, it's another movie-making venture gone horribly wrong as well. There's nothing redeemable whatsoever about this film, from the horrible special makeup effects to the downright lame plot. This is surely going to be a film that you're never going to forget. This is a special especially true by the time the payoff at the end comes along. It's a story we've seen a thousand times before, but it brings absolutely nothing new to the table whatsoever. Oh, oh, Alright Tom, you almost had us fooled. Nice. Almost. If anything, you'd think they'd have a chance, seeing as how the blueprint for horror like this already exists. Hell, even Tales from the Crypt had a 30-minute episode on a fraternity initiation gone wrong. What made these guys think they could take such a simple idea and then turn it into a full-length film? Well, they didn't. Instead, they turned it into that awkward area where it's not quite a short film and it's not quite a full-length film either. The runtime for Granny is right at 58 unbearable minutes. Don't worry. This is harmless. I thought everything through. It's gonna be a really short skit. Actually, that's the only good point I could find about this film. At least they didn't try to drudge up another 30 minutes worth of eye-rolling material. Let's cut this out. How about we do something fun instead of this ghoulish mess? The ending is one of the most cringeworthy things I've ever seen put the film and will literally leave you with your mouth hanging open and not in a good way. Trust me, you're going to be left wondering what in the hell you just watched. Butcher Boys. Or, um, uh, Bone Boys. 
When people think Kim Henkel, they usually think of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, not the other way around. That's proven to be a good thing for him, because the screenplays he's written in the years since then have been a bizarre grab bag of surreally timed comedy and sometimes too straight-faced occultism. Case in point, 2012's Butcher Boys, which is sort of like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation, meets The Skulls. Like Next Generation, Henkel brashly copies the basic story beats from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Unlike either of Henkel's chainsaw films, the cannibals and butcher boys are macho dude bros who enjoy roasting each other almost as much as roasted human flesh. I'm not proud, I'll call dibs on that shit. Hey! Who I did the job? You know, Ali, one day you're gonna become a monster. And what are you, a fucking rabbit? They also bow down to a secret society within the San Antonio underground, and have such characters as a grease-caked vigilante attempting to end their reign of terror. You don't get to learn much about the protagonists before they set off one of the Butcher Boys and wind up chased and tortured for the rest of the movie. You guessed it, just like a super aimless version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If it used Dave Dakota's casting agency. And if that gets you curious about the meaning behind this madness... Why are you people? Why are you doing this? Trust me, this isn't the film to answer your questions. Trust me, you don't want to know. After another retread of Kim Hankel's usual final act chaos, you're left with the sort of ending and hundreds of dragging plot threads for a franchise you don't particularly want to see. The general public does not want to hear that shit! Pork chop. There's a reason why slasher films are so hard to get taken seriously these days. Uh. And it's because of films like Pork Chop. We have a group of kids going camping in the middle of the woods, and they're being stalked by a killer in a pig mask. This may sound like it's a plotline from an 80s horror film, but you'd be wrong. This was released in 2010, and even has some sequels and spin-offs. So if you're wondering why the slasher genre is basically dead, it's because of films like this and its creators that can't seem to come up with a story that hasn't already been done to death. Boy's gay. Crept into the house. Grabbed the same knife. He used to kill his favorite pet. He crept up the stairs. And into his parents' bedroom. And gutted them both one by one. Therefore, you still have to wonder how they can fail at making a basic slasher film when the blueprints of thousands before it is right there. Oh, shit. Well, it can't get much worse than this, can it? Still, you have to give them props. After all, they included a robot in the film. I was, I was wrong. For reason unknown to any human alive. What, baby? You know you dug it. You tasted the grease, now suck my robot cock. And managed to make the whole experience more cringy than it already was. The Amityville Haunting. Ever seen the Amityville Horror Remake? Pretty bad, huh? What about the Amityville Curse or the Amityville Dollhouse? As bad as most of these films are, their name recognition thanks to the long con of George Lutz allows the name Amityville to be synonymous with horror. But hey, you say, at least none of the eight, or nine, Amityville movies are as boring and audience insulting as the bloated Paranormal Activity series or its clones, right? There are actually 19 Amityville movies. Ten of them made on ultra-low budgets after the remake, and at least one of them is as bad as any Paranormal Activity clone. Why? How? Because besides being the worst Amityville movie, it may also be the worst Paranormal Activity clone. We just survived our first day in the Amityville house. Creepy. Like, when our realtor showed us the house uh, that day, she died from a... a, a Aneurysm. This soulless found footage foray by the Asylum follows a nuclear family, including three children who appear to be varying levels of indifferent to the horror going on around them. Oh god. Tyler. 
I'm really not in the mood right now. But mom. But mom what? It's part of my documentary. And a veteran father who undergoes offensively over the top combat flashbacks. <laughs> They move into the Amityville house, which, as in so many other sequels, is in the suburbs for some reason. If you've seen one of this series, you've basically seen them all, and in Amityville Haunting, the same formula is adhered to. It's not okay. It is. That's just a coincidence. These things happen. Okay? That's such crap! It's, it's not this crap. house! Oh, it's this down. house! I'm in a the biggest problem is the over-the-top theatrical tone that's been typical of the series since the original True Story does not translate well at all to a film attempting to be somewhat realistic. Not that it really tries. I'm, I'm, not, funny I'm sorry, camera. but a man dying in my house does not happen every other day. There's probably a hundred people that died in this house. Oh my like God, a hundred and fifty year old house. Keep this movie in mind if you're ever watching Sharknado. This is the stuff the Asylum used to try and sell to you. You may forgive them, but don't ever forget. Jacko. This is one of those films that may have caught your attention on Netflix streaming back in the day. If not, you're lucky. If you were one of the few that checked it out, you have my pity. These are the kind of tales that drove Edgar Allan Poe to the brink of madness. I'd better go easy on you at first. The film is your typical tale of a monster returning from the grave after being resurrected by some idiotic teenagers. The monster, which has a Jocko lantern for a head, sets out to kill people. No! There's a wizard played by then dead John Carradine. Who's he? Just some creepy looking old guy. Why? and Linnea Quigley shows her boobies, which was clearly the best part of the film. Think of this one like an extremely terrible version of Pumpkinhead. The pumpkin man will steal your soul, snap it up, and swallow it whole. Then just as quick, before you die, the pumpkin man will steal your eyes. But if Pumpkinhead literally had a pumpkin for a head, and wasn't a good film at all. The Hip Hop Witch. If you watch The Amityville Haunting and still somehow find yourself with a soft spot for charming con men spreading intelligence insulting urban myths in the hopes of going viral, The Hip Hop Witch is the film to cure you of that weakness. The Hip Hop Witch is what happens when a filmmaker senses the newest phenomenon and gets the notion that it'll be easy to spoof and thereby cash in on. Need a gimmick, yo. I need a, need a gimmick, Don. I need a fucking gimmick, then you give me a fucking gimmick. A gimmick like that witch movie, yo. Small thing, man, made over a hundred million. Which shit it shall be, then it's the which shit it shall I need money, I don't give a fuck what it is. In this case, we see writer-director Dale Restaghini attempting to leech off the success of the Blair Witch Project about one year after the film's release by introducing its found footage style into an urban setting. In it, a group of stereotypes that were already outdated by 2000 go on the hunt for a witch who managed to haunt 500-something irrelevant rappers in a ridiculously short period of time. Yo, this Royce 5'9". Do not fuck with that hip-hop bitch. That bitch is fucking crazy. Yo, it's oh, Royce Staff. Black James Bond is undisputed. All right? It's Johnny Bananas right here. Rob, not Van Winkle, otherwise known as Vanilla Ice. I tell you what, man, this witch has got me going crazy. Or is it just a hoax to make these rappers relevant? That plot makes up about 20 minutes of the film, which is distributed so scarcely that you'll usually forget what major characters were doing when you last left them. Where is everyone? The rest of the film is dedicated to what I assume are loosely scripted attempts to bring star power into the film by interviewing as many rappers as possible, giving them a bullet points list of topics about the titular witch to discuss, and letting them go crazy. The bitch, the bitch got little, she, 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 she white, long, crazy, fucking snaky hair and a bunch of little monsters in her motherfucking skin. With sharp teeth, they go, ah, 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 ah. This bitch just now sold, stole my motherfucking raps. She fucking broke up my crew. She spread rumors about me and my niggas all in the motherfucking business we game. Unfortunately, after the 200th or so rapper talking about how the witch made his dick turn green, you start to feel like the crazy one. I shouldn't have a fucking bitch. My dick's turning green. Your dick's turning green? It is? It is green? It looks like a marijuana plant. Damn. 
Reminder to everyone thinking it'll be easy to spoof the Blair Witch Project, much less get rich off the same idea. Just because you can convince noteworthy people to talk about your monster for 90 minutes, doesn't mean you'll be able to keep your audience glued to their seats. Sorry. Creep Show 3. When you contemplate listing a film on a worst of list because you don't even want people to see it, you know you have something special on your hands. And that's the case with Creep Show 3. People are still baffled to this day when you mention Creep Show 3, as they didn't even know a third one existed, and there's a good reason for that. Hell, I don't even consider Creep Show 3 to be connected with the original films, and it's kind of not. Basically, there's dickheads out there that will wait for film rights to expire and then quickly pick them up, which is what happened with Creepshow 3. Therefore, it has nothing to do with the original two films and certainly nothing to do with Stephen King or George Romero. Still, you'd think if someone snagged the rights to a title like Creepshow, they'd take full advantage of the opportunity and make something awesome. Unfortunately, that's not the case here. I think I trust her. She's a whore. You can't trust a whore, Jerry. There's five tales in this film, which is like a battle royale of shittiness, where each segment battles it out with each other to be the king of the shit heap. Expect to see tales about TV remotes that can transform your family's ethnicity. The remote? Sir? Dad? Senor? Please don't touch that thing! and also turn you into an alien blob-like creature. Let's also not forget about a seductive radio that can make you murder people, and the classic story of a killer hobo that returns from the grave to stalk a doctor that gave him a hot dog that caused him to choke and die. No, I'm not kidding. Savage Planet no, not the educational disaster documentary by ITV, the TV movie produced by the Sci-Fi Channel. Yeah, the term Sci-Fi Pictures original movie has a shaky reputation attached to it, conjuring images of herds of difficult-to-tell-apart CGI creatures stalking cheap Romanian sets. But Savage Planet is not your typical Sci-Fi Pictures original. It's much, much worse. Kane's right, Stutzer. They could be trying to separate us. They're bears, damn it! The film deals with a space teleporting crew on the planet Oxygen, looking for the resource that can save the Earth. However, there are no CGI monsters or alien-looking Romanian locations to be found here, just an empty forest and a whole lot of bears. They use actual footage of bears. Like, seven or eight clips of them. I thought there's one there too. It's doubtful that even a competent editor could have saved what they had to work with, but as fate would have it, the editing in Savage Planet is the worst part of the picture. This is the kind of editing that would usually keep a film from hitting TV or even finding its way to standard def DVD. But the Sci-Fi Channel being what it's been from the mid-2000s, they let it slide. Probably banking on the idea that most viewers use these films for ambient background noise anyway. The film was written by Declan O'Brien, the same man who would go on to direct Wrong Turn 4, Wrong Turn 5, and Joyride 3. What's the matter, Kane? You jealous? Yeah. Dracula 3000. This one is similar to Creepshow 3, because it tricks you into thinking it may be connected to other films. Since this movie came out four years after Dracula 2000, you may think that this would be a sequel, but you'd be completely wrong. There's gotta be a connection. Mm, that's crazy. Instead, the filmmakers were clearly just trying to cash in on the name. I'm a Van Helsing. Your ancestors were vampire killers. You, on the other hand, are destined for far greater things, my boy. Namely, dinner. If you thought Dracula 2000 was bad, you're going to have to do better than that. You can only imagine what a desperate attempt at a cash-in has in store for you. Animal! 
<laughs> this film takes place on a spaceship that houses multiple coffins in the cargo bay full of bloodthirsty vampires, which includes Dracula, uh, uh, Orlock himself. When a dope fiend, played by Coolio, decides to break into the coffins, hoping he'll find valuables... Bro, this is how they used to smuggle shit back in the day, okay? He gets cut and the blood awakens Dracula, er, excuse me, Orlock. With a terrible plot, terrible acting, terrible writing, terrible set design, terrible makeup effects, and... <gasps> blah, blah, blah. So much more. It's no wonder Dracula 3000 makes this list. This movie is downright cheesy, especially every time Coolio decides to open his mouth and spout out some sort of satirical vampire phrase. Your wish is my command. <laughs> Udo Kier is tossed in there just to remind you that, hey, he'll do anything for a paycheck. Tiny Lister, yeah, Debo from the Friday films is in this one as a muscular grunt, and he's the only redeemable thing about this film. I put up with your shit because you're big, black, and ugly. Here we go again. After sitting through only what can be described as a horrible attempt at filmmaking, you'll be tempted to turn it off as soon as the credits begin to roll. But don't. Instead, wait around for the post credits scene featuring Tiny Lister. The scene will make you smile, but it's like putting icing on a shit cake by that point. Still, you may as well stick around and say you've seen the whole thing. If you want to make this movie a slight bit better, you can try drinking every time you notice the blonde's breasts bouncing as she jogs at an extremely light pace. Also, drink every time you see someone jog by the same corridor in the spaceship. I use the term jog lightly because it was obvious that the set design was about the size of a hamster's cage, and no one could risk running through the labyrinth of typical looking spaceship hull. Lastly, it may be worth a drink every time Coolio pops up in the frame with his eyes widened and mouth agape to show off his ridiculous looking vampire fangs. Scared, homie? Police! Actually, I say screw it. Just get drunk instead of watching this. Well, we can only hope we've given you a fair enough warning when it comes to these 10 biohazardous pictures. And if you watch any of them, then it's on you. And we have plenty more in store for the future. Or, if you'd like our rundowns on what are usually quality horror flicks and other media, subscribe to the channel and keep your ears peeled for more horror talk from Talk Horror.